Welcome to the Known Victory Church YouTube channel. We are so glad that you found us today. We exist to make Jesus known and to be a place that anyone can call home. If you haven't yet, make sure to subscribe, like, and share these messages so we can truly make Jesus known in our homes, cities, and across the world. We pray that this message impacts you and helps you to grow closer to Jesus. Uh, we have a guest speaker today, and this is one of my closest friends. This is a guy that he, we've had him here a couple times before, but this is Cooper and Chastity, some of our closest friends. Um, you know, Cooper and I, we went to high school together. We played high school football together. We played high school basketball together. In 10th grade, I played high school basketball. And then in 11th grade, the coach was like, you're probably not going to play a lot. So I was like, ah, you know what, I won't play. And then they won the provincial championship that year. And I was like, one of the biggest regrets of my life is not playing basketball. I'm like, I would have rode the bench and got a provincial ring. You know what I'm talking about? Didn't do that. Um, but... And then Cooper and I, we started serving together in Calgary at a middle church, Royal Oak Victory Church. He joined him and his wife, Chastity. They were part of our youth team for a long time. We started a brand new kind of service together. We did a lot together during COVID. It's funny, this time of year, I always get the memories. And during COVID, we live streamed for like, I think it was three months straight just from my house, just a few of us, so we could have an opportunity to serve our young adults and the youth in our city. And Cooper wasn't even a part of our team at that point, just came and started serving in that way. Just an amazing, amazing couple. So let's give it up as Cooper comes to share an incredible word with us today. All right. Hello. I am Cooper. So nice to see all of you guys. All right. As, uh, yeah, as Dustin said, we have known each other for a long, long time. Funny enough, as he mentioned that uh, live stream time when we were doing that during COVID, one of the things that we thought was a genius idea was to do a, uh, like a hot wing eating thing on live stream. I still regret that to this day. Um, it was one of, if, if you're looking for a funny video, ask him. He maybe still has it. Um, it was devastating. It was unbelievable. The worst part was even after the camera cut off was what proceeded to happen afterwards. We were like trying to like ice our mouths and it was like, it was, it was a time, but uh, everything for the kingdom, you know, that's what we're doing. Um, but uh, I am super excited to be able to be here to speak today. Um, as, as Dustin mentioned, you know, this, this is, I think the third time I think I've been here. So this is like second home to me now. This is, this is my spot. I, I love any chance I get to come and just share God's word. And uh, today is no different. Very, very excited. Um, but I'm going to dive right in today. Um, and we're going we're gonna to go through a message today that I, I hope uh, really touches you. I hope it helps you grow in your faith as well as in your life. But I want to start by asking you guys a question. And the question is, how many of you guys this morning have ever heard the saying, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again? How many of you guys have heard that before? Nice. All right. So most of you guys have heard that. Well, I was doing some research, and I found a story that couldn't show this principle in action any better. It is unbelievable. And this story actually takes place in a small mountain town in South Korea. Okay, and it centers around an older woman named Cha Sasun. Okay, you're going to see her. There she is. That's my friend. That's Miss Cha. That's my friend. She's 70 years old at the time of this story and is referred to as Mrs. Cha. That, that's her. And so Mrs. Cha actually turned into one of the most unlikely national celebrities because of a journey that she went on to get her driver's license. So for three years, starting, and this is a true story, you can look it up, three years starting in April of 2005, she took her driver's test once a day, five days a week, um, for three years trying to pass her driver's test. After that, her pace slowed a little bit to about twice a week, but she never quit. She kept doing it. Now, that means, and I'm sure some of you guys are doing the math in your head right now, that good old Miss Cha did the written portion, this is the written portion, of her driver's test 959 times. So anytime you're feeling discouraged about a test that you're struggling with, 959 times she passed on try number 960. So unbelievable. Unbelievable. But when she finally got her license, um, it says that the, the instructor all went out and cheered. They gave her flowers. They were hugging her. They were so excited. Um, it was the instructor at the school and said, uh, the instructor actually was quoted in this article saying, it felt like a huge burden falling off of our back. <laughs> 
But we didn't have the guts to tell her to quit because she kept on showing up. And now, of course, uh, Mrs. Park, another driver teacher, noted that perhaps Mrs. Cha should have been content just simply getting her uh, license and not actually getting out onto the road and driving. Um, But they were actually not too worried because when she took her uh, driving portion of the test, she actually passed it on her second try. So she was a pro. Once she was behind the wheel, she knew what she was doing. But the crazy part about this is um, when she finally got her license in May, um, Hyundai Kia Automotive Group, um, which is like the biggest uh, car dealership in South Korea, um, was uh, asking, started an online campaign asking people to post messages to congratulate Mrs. Cha on her achievement. What ended up happening is thousands of people all over the world posted messages and started actually sending in money. And so that car that you see next to her was actually presented to her by Hyundai. It was a $16,800 car for free for passing her driver's test. And so it's unbelievable. Now, a really, really funny story. Actually, the funniest part about this whole story, and I found this out afterwards, which is hilarious, but Mrs. Cha, whose name, coincidentally enough, in Korean, is actually uh, stands for vehicle. <laughs> you can't make this up. It's unbelievable. Um, now also has a primetime television commercial for Hyundai as well. She's a TV star now, so it's, it's unbelievable. It's one of the craziest stories I've ever seen. Um, but this incredible story, I, I had to read multiple times to, to believe and look up on multiple websites to confirm. But uh, when I first read it, I thought to myself, the first thought that came into my mind was, how in the world do you fail a test 959 times? How in the world is that possible? But then soon after, that thought kind of started to shift in my mind, and I was like, I wonder how her driving is right now. Like, is she still doing good? Like, how's it going? But then eventually, that thought morphed in my mind to, wow, this woman is determined I mean, I can't imagine if I was in her shoes how many times I would have given up along that journey. I can tell you guys right now, honest truth, there's no way in this world I'm writing a test 959 times. It's not happening. I would have given up multiple times along that journey. And if you think about it, can you imagine the discouragement and disappointment that she would have felt walking into that office every single day to take the test with, I'm sure, employees laughing at her, telling her to give up, telling her that she, she's never going to get this done, she's never going to make it happen, but she didn't. And it's that God-given characteristic of perseverance that I want to talk about this morning in our sermon that's going to be titled, Defeating Discouragement. Defeating Discouragement. I'm going to be using the, uh, the book of Haggai today for our journey, and um, I just want to give you a bit of a recap before we dive in. This is an incredible book, and it's one that um, oftentimes we skip over. It's only, you know, two short chapters, and we think there can't be so, too much in there, but there's so much within those two chapters. Um, and a little recap, starting all the way back, they started with, uh, in, in this book, they uh, are talking about King Solomon who built for God the most magnificent temple. Um, it was incredible. It was glorious. It was mind-blowing how incredible it was. This is like a rendition of what they think it maybe kind of looked like. Um, and for the time, that is like crazy. The architecture of that is unbelievable. And people came from all over the world to worship God and to show him honor, and quite honestly, just to see the glory of that temple. Unfortunately, we know that uh, after King Solomon died, people turned away from God. As we often do, they got distracted. They started worshiping idols. And so God allowed a series of events to take place to bring their focus back towards him. And so in 587 BC, under the rule of King Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian army um, destroyed and completely devastated Judah including the massive insult of destroying the house of God that Solomon had built, the temple. So the Babylonians took the Jewish people into captivity for seven decades. Seventy years is a long time they're in captivity. And so you can only imagine the sense of relief and hope for the first time in 70 years when a remnant of people were allowed to go back to their homeland to rebuild. 
And so this is kind of where we're at now. And now they're under the rule of the governor at the time. His name was Governor Zerubbabel, which is one of my favorite all-time names in the Bible. Um, my wife and I are having a child soon. I've been fighting for Zerubbabel. I don't think that name is going to go, but I'm trying my best. Um, but in roughly 520 BC, um, we see actually in the book of Ezra, about 50,000 or so people um, went back to rebuild the city. And the first priority they had, the number one thing they wanted to do was to rebuild the temple, to rebuild the house of God. And so they get this foundation in place. They're starting to build. They've got the altar in place. And they were met with some resistance. They were met with some, some discouragement. They're like, ah, you know, this isn't necessarily going the way we thought it would. And so guess what they did? They gave up. They gave up. They were like, ah. We're done with this. And so for 16 years, it says in the Bible that this temple sat unfinished with no progress. 16 years. And this is when God raises up the prophet Haggai to call the people back to the task. He says, don't focus on your own homes, but focus on God's house. Let's put God first. And so we're going to pick up the story with that context in mind. That's our brief recap for this morning. But we're going to go into Haggai chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. I'm going to be reading out of the ESV version. One of the beautiful things about uh, Haggai's writing is he actually dates all of his letters, which is really, really cool, because then you can kind of see the progress and what's happening in the timeline of it. Um, And so it's really, really great. So this letter that we're about to read is happening actually on August 29th. So it gives us the exact date, which is really cool. It says, Then Haggai, the messenger of the Lord, spoke to the people with the Lord's message, saying, I am with you, declares the Lord. And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, the governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and worked on the house of the Lord, of uh, the Lord of hosts, their God. So as we read this, we see the process that, of what God does to be able to help them in their time of discouragement. So what did God do? God stirred up the spirit of the governor, the high priest, and all the people. Well, what does God often do in our life? Well, God will often do the very same thing. He will stir up our spirit when we begin to get discouraged. God gives you hope to accomplish something that God puts on your mind. And this is what he's doing for the people in Haggai. He gave them a sense of faith. We're supposed to rebuild this temple. He stirs up their spirits. And this will happen for those of us that are followers of Jesus in the very same way. There will be those times like out of the blue and we just feel that kind of sense in our spirit of like, wow, I feel like I'm supposed to do this. I feel like I'm supposed to do this thing. And you have that excitement and energy to do it. You have faith for something and you want to attack it. And that's because God has stirred up your spirit. The story goes this way. It says, they came and began to work on the house of the Lord Almighty. They've got got this attitude. They say, we can do this. We're going to build God an amazing temple. We can do this. One month goes by, and guess what happened? They quit again. Yeah, they did. They quit again. Um, One month goes by. They're like, we can do this. A month later, they fizzle out, and they quit again. Now, how many of us here this morning can honestly say that the very same thing has happened in our life before? I know for me it has. I get inspired. I get stirred up by God to go after something, to chase down a dream, to pursue a goal. And before I know it, I find myself discouraged, distracted, and sometimes flat out disinterested in the very thing that God wanted me to go after. I know for me this happened actually just recently um, in my life when my wife and I decided to do a renovation in our house. Now, if you are here this morning, you've ever done some major home renos, you know, it's a very easy thing to dream about. It's a much harder thing to execute, Um, especially when you plan on doing the work yourself, which is what we thought we would do. So this is our journey. We started with this. This is our, our, our kitchen that we had in our home. Um, when we moved in, we were like, this is great. It, it works, but it has about two cabinets, and we don't have anywhere to put anything. And so we're grinding, and we're battling, and we're like, okay, we're going to make this happen. So 
the fun part begins at this moment. This was my favorite part of the whole thing because now um, we are in the demo mode. And so I was so excited. I was like, I get to just start smashing some cabinets, which was really like stress relieving and awesome all at the same time. And um, it's a very therapeutic process. And so if you're feeling like you need to let off some steam, maybe go do help someone with a reno, but just do the demo part. Um, yeah, just tear it all up. But anyway, so we started tearing things up and this is what it ended up looking like. Like, um, this was kind of along the process. So you can see that back wall. We've ripped everything off of the back wall. Um, we're starting to tear up the island that's there. This was the moment where all of a sudden I realized I can't go back. Like, this, this is happening now. I, I, I can't go back. The joy of smashing has now turned into the reality of rebuilding. And I didn't like that very much. Um, I remember multiple times along this, like, this took us, like, six months. I remember multiple times along this six-month journey saying, like, I can't do this. Like, physically, I can't do this. Mentally, I can't do this. Financially, I can't do this. I'm going to be honest, spiritually, I'm not feeling great about it either. And so, this is a struggle right now. And so, it was quite discouraging, but um, just when we thought we were on the home stretch, about to finish our kitchen reno project, we ran into this, okay? So, this, um, you can see there, uh, what it is, is it's a hole in the floor. And the reason it's a hole in the floor is because this whole reno was centered around the fact that we wanted to move our kitchen island. Now, again, I'm a dreamer. I'm not an executor. And so I dreamt that that would be awesome. I didn't realize that I don't know how to do plumbing. And so I was like, I don't know how to move this thing to where we want it to be. And so this is a, this is a real, real struggle moment. Um, I looked at this hole as if I was reading a new language. I was like, I don't know what any of these things are down here. And so I did what every good husband does. I turned, I smiled at my wife, and I said, this is easy. Nothing to it. Don't you worry. Meanwhile, I stared back into the hole and said, <laughs> I have no idea what is going to happen. So inside, I knew I was in big trouble, now creating a large hole in our floor and knowing that I didn't have the knowledge to fix it. And so I did what every good Christian does. I prayed, and when I looked down, it was still a hole. It was still a hole. And so um, it hadn't fixed itself. And so then I did what any other good Christian does. I actually uh, called our lead pastor, Pastor Dave Myers, um, which some of you guys maybe have seen him. He's come and maybe spoke here at some of your guys' stuff. But um, Pastor Dave is incredible. He is awesome. He is like the guy that like loves to fix everything. I don't know if he really has like the training to fix everything, but he just loves to do it. Um, and so I called him over to my house and I was like, you know what, Let's. I, I need your help. And Pastor Dave being the incredible guy he was, he came over. And now instead of staring into a hole alone, I got to stare into it together with someone else. It was awesome. It was like, this is great. Neither of us fully confident that we knew um, how to move this over or make it work. Um, we were just staring in a hole. But we began drawing out diagrams and measuring out distances and we, what we needed to move. And we went to Home Depot together, got a bunch of supplies, came back to the house. And we're like, we're just going to do it. We're going to try. And we started moving things around. And by the end of the evening, we actually had finally got it kind of into the right location. And I, uh, I had a deep sense of relief in this moment. I was like, wow, we actually are going to get to the other side here. I, and when I say we had to push through, we really had to push through. There was a moment where we were shifting these pipes around. And because they're all glued together, so you can kind of see like kind of maybe in that picture, kind of this part at the back that's going up. Um, they're kind of, they're glued together. So we had to move them around. And so you have to kind of like twist them to break the glue in order to like get them to move. Again, probably the wrong way to do it guilty, but that's what we were doing. And um, so we're twisting them around, and I'll never forget this moment. I'm trying to twist one um, to, like, get it so that we can move it and then, like, get it out of there. And, um, and so I'm trying to twist it and break the glue, and I'm, I'm doing it as hard as I can. Um, unfortunately, what happens is when the glue breaks, it goes from being very hard to move to very easy to move. And I will never forget this moment for the rest of my days. There was a particular piece that came up, and it had like a T that came out this way. And so I'm turning really, really hard on this, and all of a sudden the glue breaks. And I'm telling you, the T part just starts moving real quick. But in my mind, it's actually going slow motion like we're in an action film. And all of a sudden, this thing is moving in slow-mo. And the more I look, I see Pastor Dave's face is right here. 
And I'm telling you, guys, this is like, it's literally, I'm like, no. And it's going literally, and and it was moving fast. And I'm like, oh, no, this is unbelievably horrible. I'm like trying not to cry inside. It's spinning. And then all of a sudden, hits him right in the face. Yeah, I was like, I am going to be completely honest with you. In this moment, I stopped, I looked up to heaven, and I said, do I still get in? (laughs) Or have I just ruined it? (laughs) Is this the end for me? I'm telling you, I mean, you hit your pastor in the face with a plumbing pipe. I don't know what that does to your heavenly reputation, but it can't be good. It cannot be good. Um, luckily, no one was hurt. He was fine. He uh, laughed it off. Whew, we, uh, I still have my job, so we're, we're okay. Um, but we were able to reconnect everything. And, and we, we all of a sudden, by the end of this night, had gotten through all of this six months of hard work, crying, bleeding, sweating, praying. Everything was gone. And we had started with our original image, like we showed you there. Um, And now, after six months and a pastor's broken cheek, we ended up with this. Yeah, pretty crazy, eh? Yeah. So we redid, like, the whole thing. The whole thing is done now. It's amazing. We did the whole project ourselves. We didn't have to bring anybody in to help with any of it other than Pastor Dave, who regrets that decision. Um, and uh, (laughs) And we were able to get this done. Now, I'm going to be honest with you, this will be my last reno for a while. Um, I think, I don't know if I can handle the emotional roller coaster again, the, the arguments, the times we wanted to quit and give up um, before just picking it back up again the next day. Um, it was a constant fight against discouragement and distraction. But we all are like that to some degree, and we all have some kind of reno going on in our life at all times. You know, we say we're going to go, we're going to go and we're going to get out of debt. We're going to get out of debt this year. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, Christmas, I have to buy a hundred gifts and now I'm not getting out of debt. Well, forget about that. It's December again. So we're just moving on. Or I'm going to go on a diet. I'm going to really do this. I'm going on a diet. Oh my goodness. Five guys. That's my weak spot. The Lord knows. And so then it's like, I'm going to go on a diet later. I'm going to try tomorrow. Um, Or, you know, we're going to go to the gym every year, every January. The gym is filled, and you're all there in the gym having fun. And then by February, it's empty, and nobody is there anymore. And all the people that really go to the gym are quite happy um, at that point. But we always have that. We say we're going to do this, and then we don't make the progress that we think we should make, and we get incredibly discouraged. And that's exactly what happened to the people of God in Haggai. They spent 16 years, which become wasted years of their lives, not obeying God's commands to build the temple. And then they get all fired up, begin building, but then hit a roadblock and quit again. August 29th, they begin building. October 17th, like I said, these letters are dated. They're discouraged. And now, let me tell you um, all this morning that the enemy doesn't always need to destroy us. He doesn't always need to come in with all of these different crazy tactics. Far too often we think it's this massive destruction that needs to happen for it to be the devil trying to take us away from what God has for us. I would argue that more often than not, it's not the destruction that the enemy uses, but instead it's distraction and discouragement. It's distraction and discouragement. And two causes of discouragement that I believe are the number, are the, the top two things that are really plaguing us right now, and I want to talk about this morning. The first one is comparisons, and the second one is lack of progress. Comparisons and lack of progress. I don't know about you, but I can get incredibly discouraged a lot of the time when I compare where people are that I am not. Maybe as an example, you say to yourself, well, he's got a six-pack, he's got an amazing car, a fantastic house, I've got a one-pack, my car barely runs, and I'm renting in a bad neighborhood. Or maybe you compare your kids with their kids. You know, you, you look at their kids, their kids are in school, they go in their perfect matching outfits, they go with baked goodies every single day, like who's baking these things? Um, they have college credit in the fifth grade, you're like, what am I doing? Like, I, I don't even know what's happening. And then you're sitting there being like, I can't, honestly can't remember if I packed my kids a lunch. I can't remember if that happened. And now I'm thinking, and I'm really trying to figure this out, I don't know if they're even wearing pants today. I didn't help out with that process either. 
And all of a sudden you're like, wow, like you think about it, I, I feel like I'm a, I'm a massive loser. Or you just got to go look on Instagram and you're like, well, she was invited. No one invited me. He's traveling for the third time this year. I can't even afford groceries. And you're comparing all of these different things and suddenly you feel incredibly discouraged. What's wrong with me? Why am I like this? Why am I here and they are there? It's because you compared, and just like they did um, in Haggai, you compared to the, the temple that Solomon built versus our little attempt to build, this new, uh, to build this new temple, and it pales in comparison. Now, now we're failures. Now we're discouraged. Now we don't know what to do with that. Now we don't know how to proceed. And then if that's not enough, then there's also just lack of progress. You know, this is, this is what they did. They were months into this, and it wasn't going well. And so they said, we're trying so hard, but we're not getting anywhere. And this is how we often feel. You know, they're building this temple, and they're like, we've been going at this for a long time. I don't know how Solomon got this temple up so fast, but we are not doing well. And we do the same thing. We do this exact same thing. You're, you say, you know what, I'm going to, again, go on a diet. I'm going to get in shape. And so for a whole month, I'm going to eat almonds. You bet, almonds. And then at the end of that month, you're like, I gained two pounds. What in the world just happened? Or you start a business and you take two steps forward and then it seems like three steps backwards. Or maybe for you, it's even in your whole spiritual life, you feel like there's lack of progress. Maybe you're saying to yourself, I've been a Christian for all this time and yet I still am making mistakes. You know, maybe even for some of us this morning, maybe you got cut off on the, your way into church this morning and you cussed that person out the whole way here. And then all of a sudden, like I'm, I'm, I'm talking like you said more swear words than you even knew there was in the vocabulary on the way into church this morning. And then all of a sudden you get here and you're standing and then you're sitting here going, here I am to worship. It's like, yikes. It's been a tough day for me. I'm, I'm struggling. And you think to yourself, why am, I, why am I not farther along? I think I would be better off. I, you, and so you wake up every single day, and the first thought that you have is discouragement. It's not where I thought I would be. So what do we do about this? What do you do when you find yourself consistently dis discouraged, when you wake up and you're feeling discouraged? How do we combat this very real opposing force in our life and go from a place of passive living due to the restraints of discouragement and distraction and step into a place of perseverance living out the life that God has called us to live? Well, I want to show you what God tells his people to do um, uh, when, they're, when they're in this very same place. They're building the temple. It's not going well. It's never going to be as good as Solomon's temple. They're comparing. They have lack of progress. They're doing the best they can, they can, and it's just not good enough. God gives them, in this moment, some of the most loving and simple instructions. And to me, it's one of the most beautiful things about this book in Haggai um, is just how loving God is in this moment. Look at this in Haggai chapter two, verse four. It says, but, the Lord says, but now the Lord says, be strong, Zerubbabel. Be strong, Jeshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Be strong, all you people still left in the land. And now get to work, for I am with you, says the Lord of heaven's armies. Now, I love this because this is that inspirational moment. This is that locker room talk. The coach comes in. Um, this is what's happening. God is coming to encourage his people. Um, he's encouraging Haggai to be the prophet that he's called to be and to motivate them towards what God is calling them to do. And notice what he says on behalf of God. He says, be strong, get to work, and know that I am with you. He says, be strong, get to work, and know that I am with you. See, the great news is that we don't have to be strong on our own power. We live in New Testament times, and our New Testament teaches us that when you are weak, his strength is made perfect through you. In other words, I don't have to be strong in my own strength. I've got a supernatural strength that dwells within me. The same spirit that raised Christ from the dead is the same spirit that dwells within those who believe. So what do you do when you're discouraged? You be strong. You do the work. You be strong. You do the work. Notice he didn't say be strong and talk the talk, but to do the work. Notice he didn't even say be strong and dream the dream, but he says do the work. 
He doesn't say compare the results. He says do the work. So what do you do when you're discouraged? You be strong in his power and you do the work. You know, there's a great quote by Pastor Craig Rochelle. It says, successful people do consistently what other people do occasionally. See, if we want to overcome this sense of discouragement that we feel, it's being able to consistently discipline ourselves to wake up every morning, to have a devotional life, to start your day in a sense of positivity and purpose rather than being overcome by discouragement before you even get out of bed. Be strong in the Lord. Put down another stone and another stone, and before you know it, there will be something built in front of you that you never thought possible. When you want to give up, what do you do? You be strong. Keep praying even when you don't see the results. You be strong and continue to open up God's word and seek him daily. You be strong and continue to do the right thing even when you feel like you're not getting anywhere. You be strong and continue to show up and exercise even when the numbers are going in the wrong way. You be strong and continue to pay off your debt even if it's only $10 a month. You take that step in the right direction. And you do it day after day and week after week and month after month and year after year. And like I said, before you know it, that discouragement will turn into achievement because you are making progress. You be strong and continue to love even when other people are not loving in return. You be strong and bring your best when everyone else in your team is not bringing their best. You be strong and continue to love your spouse even when your spouse may seem unresponsive. You be strong and continue to reach out to that person that God has placed in your heart even when you feel like they're not hearing you or not letting you in. You be strong and continue to love your children, to pray for your children, to stand for your children, even when they are struggling to stand for anything that you believe is right. You continue to pray for them. You know, at this time, I'm going to invite the worship team to join me up here or the piano, but... um, Even begin to speak this over your life um, when you're in places of discouragement. To say that by the power of God which dwells in me, I will be strong. Wake up and say these affirmations to yourself. The power of God which dwells in me, I will be strong because of that. I will continue to show up. I will continue to pray. Speak it over yourself and watch how God begins to stir up your spirit and keep pushing you forward. God says, be strong and do the work. Why? For I am with you, declares the Lord. This is the key to all of it. It's not that you do it on your own. It's that you do it with him. There's a verse in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 11 to 12. It says, our great desire is that you will keep on loving others as long as life lasts. In order to make certain that what you hope for will come true. Then you will become not spiritually dull and indifferent. Instead, you will follow the example of those who are going to inherit God's promises because of their faith and endurance. Faith and endurance. Be like those who stay the course with committed faith and get everything promised to them. You know, be imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises of God. It's faith and a never give up attitude is what takes us from the bondage of discouragement into the blessings of abundance. You know, we came this morning with the goal of coming together to determine how um, we as a church can be a church that doesn't succumb to the derailment that comes with discouragement and distraction. I believe wholeheartedly that the way that we do that is found in what we learned this morning, and I believe it can be summarized like this. Discouragement is defeated when our why begins to outweigh our why not, when our discipline overrides our distraction, and when our determination overwhelms our discouragement. The next time you feel weary, the next time you feel discouraged, the next time you're ready to give up at work, on your health, with your family, in your marriage, or in your faith, remember God is with you. And if you are willing to keep taking just the next step forward, he will meet you right there in that place, just as he did for the people in Haggai. God's covenant is unchangeable. His presence is guaranteed. 
and his spirit will abide in us forever. Forever. See, the, this, this is, it's, it's a season to start building again, to overcome that discouragement. Just like our good friend, Mrs. Cha, God has some good things in store for us. The question is simply, will we have the strength and courage to walk through the valley of discouragement to get to the mountain peak of our destiny? To be able to walk through all of that discouragement to get where God is calling us to be. Let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, God, we just thank you so much for your word, Father. God, I just want to specifically right now pray for anyone in this room that has been maybe plagued by discouragement, that has been distracted and discouraged, that they wake up every morning and they roll out of bed and just say, wow, I have to endure another day. Father God, I just want to pray that you would meet them right there in that place. That, Father God, that they would no longer wake up thinking of what they have to endure that day, but they would wake up saying, how can I be a blessing today? How can I make an impact today? That, God, that you would be able to speak into their hearts, that your spirit would stir them up, just as you did for the people in Haggai, to stir up their spirit, to say, I'm called for more than just an average life. I'm called for an abundant life because of the God that dwells within me, because of the Holy Spirit that dwells within me, because of the Jesus that died so that I could live in abundance. Father God, I just pray that you would continue to just lead everybody in this church, God, that you would guide them, that, Father, that they would continue to overcome the obstacles that are in front of them because there's blessings on the other side. And so, Father, we just thank you, and we just pray all in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.